Welcome everybody to Boost CYC's webinar series. My name is Shelley Cavanaugh and I'm here on behalf of myself and Suzanne Thompson. And the two of us will be hosting today's webinar. However, before we begin, there's just a few points we'd like to share with you. For participants listening in French, click on floor at the bottom left of the screen and select French. To see and follow along with the PowerPoint presentation in English, click presentation on the top left of the screen. To follow along with the presentation in French, download the French version of the presentation by clicking on documents on the right. Feel free to download the presentation in both English and French by clicking on documents on the right. There'll be a, a question and answer uh, period during the last few minutes of the webinar. Um, however, if there's any additional questions that are not answered, feel free to email Pearl and um, Pearl will forward those questions to uh, Suzanne and I will do our best to mm. respond. Um, in the meantime, you could also submit, submit any questions by going to the toolbar on the right, click on messaging and then participants. And here you can type in your question. You can submit your questions at any time. If you're watching this webinar in a group, please enter the number of participants in the group by clicking on messaging and then participants. Thank you so much. And we're going to begin our discussion with a land acknowledgement. Thank you so much, Shelley. Welcome. I love the mystery that we're stepping in with one another and meeting online. So we wish to begin by acknowledging uh, with humility and respect that we're the uninvited guests and settlers on the land in which we work and live. The territory of the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Welcome Belt Covenant, an agreement to share peacefully and care for the Great Lakes region. And the beautiful mural that's before you is uh, from a wonderful uh, art therapist and dear colleague, Aurora Monique Bedard and Chief Ladybird. And they collaborated with a group of youth at Ruth's uh, Public School um, in Takaronto, Toronto, to acknowledge the dish with the one spoon wampum belt. Thank you for, uh, for starting us. And so for the next uh, 50 or so minutes, um, what you can expect is that there'll be a lot of um, sharing with respect to mindfulness and our practice with clay, um, how clay art therapy and social activism um, combined together can be an incredible conduit to healing and uh, transformation. And just with respect to influences, uh, between Suzanne and I, we have influences through DBT, Renzai Zen, and sensory motor psychotherapy. Thank you, Shelley. And there's a gorgeous image we wanted to start with one of the voices from the participants because the work that we've been doing over the years at the Gardner Museum and this artist, I'm going to just share a brief excerpt from her artist statement. And she called it shared world. She shares that using clay, I tried to create my dream home, a shared world, a world in which women and the rest of marginalized people would be considered human as well and given a place and freedom. If you share my dream, let's get started. Together, we can make it come true by creating a free space, not only for women, but for also any other person. We all have one world to share. So in that sharing, I know another great teacher of yours, Suzanne. Richard Wagamese, yeah. and I've never given a book out more of this one book to so many folks. It's a beautiful book uh, titled Embers, and, um, and it's by Richard Wagamese, who's Ojibwe, and he's one of Canada's foremost writers, and he wrote um, beloved books such as um, The Indian Horse and Medicine Walk. And this particular book, I want, I mean, the quote I would love to turn our attention towards really waters the seeds of our presentation today. I've been considering the phrase all my relations for some time now. It's hugely important. It's our saving grace in the end. It points to the truth that we're all related. We are all connected. We all belong to each other. The most important word is all. Not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me speak like me, pray like me, or behave like me. 
all my relations. It means every person, just as it means every blade of grass, rock, mineral, and creature. We live because everything else does. If we were to choose collectively to live that teaching, the energy of that change of consciousness would heal all of us and the planet. We do it one person, one heartbeat at a time. We are connected. We are the answer. So beautiful. And when Suzanne and I were putting uh, this PowerPoint together, uh, for me, it was I was really um, moved by the cover of this book and just with respect to connecting with the embers. And it's very much like the, you know, mm. the work that we're speaking about today mm. and the work that we do in terms of literally sometimes moving into the fire mm -hmm. um, with, with those that we work with. And then of course the transformation of fire uh, through the clay process. And so, so excited to, um, sh to share more. Thank you, Shelley. And, and in the fire, you know, we first begin with, uh, you know, in terms of the clay and uh, another teacher of mine, Paulus Berenson, uh, wrote this incredible book, A Way of Being with Clay, Being in the Here and Now. And so anytime I meet with folks for the first time working with clay, I'll invite them uh, to do a pinch pot. And it was inspired by Paul Sperenson, who was originally a dancer, then became a choreographer, and then shared that he found a true dance through clay. Mm -hmm. And creating a pinch pot is simply with a ball of clay and then just opening the clay on your exhalation and just pinching the sides of the clay to the rhythm of your breath. And it's such a beautiful way to connect with that sense of interrelatedness with our body, the clay body, the sense you know, in relationship with our breath. And in addition, I would say too, it's such a uh, beautiful way of really regulating one's breath. Because mm. um, it's literally you, as you um, inhale and then exhale, moving to the core. And that's exactly what we're doing within our bodies. Because mm -hmm. it's like move, uh, moving from our center of gravity, you know, in terms of um, Cornelia Albrecht really talks you know, talks about here how we move from our hara. So that's, for example, within Zen Buddhism, just below our um, our belly button, our center of gravity. You know, so actually um, breathing low and slow. You know, from our core and actually exhaling into the pinch pot and that. Uh, and uh, I love the idea of she, how she shares how the pelvic bowl, you know, is actually the seat of our core. And, and we just wanted to share these two books, because just if you're interested more around sensory motor practices and um, using art therapy, she's been a, a leader. And these, one, one book is with respect to working with drawing and working with clay. And so for me, I so um, I so love this mm -hmm. slide because I think it really is so indicative mm -hmm. of how clay really is part of our DNA. It's something that has been available from the beginning of time, from the beginning of humanity, in terms of working with tools, creating tools in order for survival. Mm -hmm. And then I also think about uh, just with respect to the universe, wherever there's water, uh, clay mm -hmm. is, is accessible and found. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this um, is just a reminder um, with respect to, as I said, being part of our DNA. And I love um, when working with clay, just in terms of haptic perception, how that's engaged and that touches the first sense, you know, um, one of the first sensory responses to develop in humans. So I love this dance between, you know, the, what happens in the interlatedness between clay and our DNA. <laughs> Um, Michael Franklin uh, wrote a book just recently um, called Contemplative Practices in the Arts, and he were uh, uh, an art therapist uh, who teaches at Naropa University, and he shares um, beautifully how the suppleness of clay can teach the mind to do the same, to bend, flex, and release, you know, how it's an autotelic practice where the like there's the experience in that's in lived practice so the moving and being with you know in terms of how we are malleable can be malleable like the clay oops sorry <laughs> move back there we go and so um uh, here's a, a an opportunity to um, visit one of the first sculptures for um, today, and I know Suzanne, uh, this was something that had come out of one of the projects that you had worked with. 
and a key piece ar around the, the projects is that they're third stage, it's third stage trauma. So thinking of Judith Herman's work is that essentially there's three stages to trauma work, first stage around safety and stabilization, and then second stage around processing and third stage around reconnection and you know, reintegrating, moving forward into community. And our work is uh, very political. And so how, how are we always unpacking that context? And um, so I think it's also just what ends up happening too is participants then become really agents of change when it comes to creating sculptures that then go on public exhibit. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> to dance here on the set as well. <laughs> and uh, I'm Michael White, uh, co-founder of Narrative Therapy. Um, Oh my goodness, I love this quote, you know, it's never a matter of whether or not we bring politics into the therapy room, but whether or not we're prepared to acknowledge the existence of these politics and the degree to which we're prepared to be complicit in the reproduction of these politics. And so I think it's really important to think, um, for example, uh, working from an intersectional lens in terms of being mindful of social location around race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, religion, you know, determining oh, yeah, one's place in society. And that, you know, how some benefit from places of privilege like myself and, you know, the unearned privileges and at the cost of others. And how are we considering that you know, in terms of how we step into the room as, uh, our, um, as therapists uh, in relationship to our clients, you know, to really pay attention to impacts of colonization, uh, the neoliberal near liberalism you know so how are we really looking at all these intersecting uh, spaces that are happening at one and the same time so how do we how do we address that well the, I think uh, the artists are always so eloquent you know in terms of kind of speaking right from the heart of what the project's all about so there's this um, often uh, the adults um, that I'm working with will create a collective statement and so uh, that is then offered to the public in response to the exhibits. And this is an excerpt from one of the uh, exhibits called Breaking the Mold, Recreating Home. Uh, they share, our spirits rise above assault, abuse and violence, channeling our trauma into creativity, recovery, renewal and reinvention. Through clay we heal, Collectively, we stitch the gaping wound. And so on this idea about uh, community as a collective, uh, this slide's been included to share how an art response offered a connection between children living oceans apart. So it was really through a global reply to the 160 girls project that came out of Maru, Kenya, that was catapulted mm -hmm. by the work from Kenyan social worker, Mercy Chaldi, and Toronto lawyer Fiona Sampson, yeah. who were actually brought together by Stephen Lewis. And it was about um, girls who had been sexually assaulted in Kenya um, and uh, previously hadn't been supported, uh, but what this work had been uh, able to bring perpetrators to justice where previously it hadn't happened. And so uh, this is a sculpture that was created by a group of uh, children and youth working together um, when they had heard about what was going on with the girls in Kenya. And so um, they wanted to share their support and um, as, a, as a means of doing it this way, um, what happened was there was an image then with, that was taken from the ceramic sculpture that was then created into a photo transfer, put in the center of uh, what was then made into a very, very large quilt. And there was over kind of 200 responses on this quilt from, from folks from all over messages of support, mm. then that quilt was then brought to Ripple's Orphanage in Meru, where it continues mm. to hang. And then children in Meru, and who had heard about uh, here in Toronto that there's um, places of healing for mm. children and young people who've experienced sexual abuse, they did an art response that came back to Toronto and was shared with, with um, kids here. Extraordinary work, yeah. and it's so important to cry, you know, share these char stories across communities and how we all are strengthened and makes you think of, um, you know, in terms of One Billion Rising. And Beautiful so, project. right on February 14th, and inspired by, you know, so Eve Ensler. And so in 2013, uh, there, 
on February 14th marked the largest global action in history to end violence against women and girls. And you know, this project uh, was at the same time as a three-month project that was uh, a retrospective of the work that um, had been done for 10 years with respect to the um, ceramics and uh, women. So folks who are, um, you know, to include uh, cisgender, transgendered, and those uh, who hold fluid identities you know, who are subject to gender-based violence, sharing their stories through clay. And the um, name of the show was Transformation by Fire, which isn't by any accident, because we're <laughs> all changed, you know, by the courage of the artists and sharing their stories to, in the hopes of creating mm -hmm. social change. So at this particular time, it's like, how do we join with other movements around the world? And so with One Billion Rising in 2013, there was a flash mob dance. And so this was just an image of um, our participation in response to a, a global movement. So really hearing how art, art therapy and social activism coming together can really um, increase the uh, experience of, of people becoming um, really agents of change. Uh, in, in their work and of course how it can continue to to, to spread. And it, it centers people, you know, some, uh, the folks that we're working with as uh, they're the educators and not, and centering them not from a place of stigma or pathology. They're the experts they are. and they teach us they all, all the time. time. <laughs> <laughs> Constantly love learning. <laughs> Yeah, so that unlearning and learning, that energy of metamorphosis and change is uh, a thread that runs throughout this project. And another, uh, so we just wish to share another quote um, from another collective statement. Um, we are strong and fragile like the clay we work with. It soothes and calms us, mm -hmm. connecting us with our creative passion, moving us forward in our lives. And I love the the energy of that statement. It really yes embodies, uh, you know, working with clay and its smooth soothing properties. And I think just even from kind of a DBT lens, in terms of how different kind of skills get um, have an opportunity mm. to be practiced. And there's so there's this skill called self soothing in terms of of regulating emotions. And here it's you know it is um, what a great opportunity to to be practicing. So we just wish to um, share a quote by uh, Kathy Macchiotti, who uh, in the West uh, has made a significant contribution with respect to art therapy. And she share, cites um, a study that was done by Nan and Ho. And so I just want to refer my notes here for a moment because um, Nan's doctoral research was with the effects of clay and art therapy with adults with major depressive or disorders and was able clearly to, to, to sorry, to, uh, too much excitement here. <laughs> That's right, I got to breathe low, low and, and slow. slow. <laughs> What we really needed was to have some play with us when we were doing this. Oh my goodness, that was it. Again, <laughs> learning time, and unlearning. <laughs> I know, of course we're supposed to have play. Okay, but their study was so significant because it demonstrated the therapeutic effects of clay, you know, in releasing energy and tension, which could have happened here, providing and channeling sensation, evoking emotion, regulating emotion through the creation of form, and additionally help participants develop cognitive skills for increased problem solving and creating meaningful symbolic forms. So just really wanted to uh, cite that study if you're interested because that uh, really it's in terms of how um, working with clay is a real bottom up approach, which I'm gonna talk about from a sensory motor perspective. So with respect to symbolism and building on that, wanted to share this, um, Mm. a photo of a sculpture that was created by a 16 year old who really spoke about um, their experience of being on something like a Ferris wheel, never being able to get off. And so um, it was really through the, the um, process of, of the project that, um, sh that they were able to both move towards um, an acceptance of, of this past traumatic history, as well as being um, more prepared for change. And I would say too that, you know, that's a, that's a constant, <laughs> constant in our work too, moving between acceptance and change and also noticing judgment. And I think again, the 
projects really provide a great opportunity to really help um, participants really notice judgment and, and as a way of um, being able to more succinctly notice what's the judgments of oneself because it, it, there's a constant this interplay between what's being created and what's being experienced internally. And so I would just, just with respect to this um, idea about um, acceptance and change, the same would be said for validation and compassion. And so that too has been something that I think has been um, monumental in, in terms of, of really the healing process. And so again, being in a shared space and uh, working in community, I think really allows uh, that compassion to be fully um, lived by participants and just a constant validation that that um, we are not alone. Mm -hmm. And so just keeping in, like I said, with a perspective of uh, dialectical behavior therapy, um, it really uh, gives way for the constant practice of mindfulness. In fact, every group is begins and ends with a practice um, with respect to distress tolerance. It's not unusual in the room. Um, for instance, if somebody is um, working with um, a piece of clay and it might not be doing what they necessarily want it to be doing, being able to really kind of, um, find ways of uh, managing that mm -hmm. distress. Um, and the same would be for regulating emotions. Um, and and um, most beautifully too is this opportunity to practice interpersonal effectiveness skills. So this idea about um, working within relationships, being able to ask for what what wants. Um, and so communication sometimes that occurs uh, for individuals who might not necessarily um, feel like that that's been something that has um, necessarily occurred pre in previous groups when in particular, if it's been relying um, mm. solely on, on talk. Mm. Mm. Would just like to share. This was a, a beautiful um, example of of the transformation evolution of, of a particular individual who came into a group. Who initially, even when they arrived, um, and that in itself was quite difficult. Even coming into into the uh, space, uh, the art room that we were working in, and then eventually coming in and almost like as if being in a shell um, in, in terms of huddled at the table. And over time, I just love this quote. Um, that really, um, I think, was indicative of, of this sculpture that ended up being produced. And here it is, of, compassion is a fundamental principle of meditation. Meditation is not a narcissistic, self-interested path. It actually provides foundation for love, integrity, compassion, respect, and sensitivity. And it was through this, and as I said, you can see that, you know, um, having hands become open and that vulnerability being um, being prepared to be witnessed and, and nurtured. And I love, yeah, just what's so beautifully expressed in the hands in that piece, right? And well, embodied in that piece. And and that that's an extraordinary piece. Or, or, I mean, how people's lived experience is expressed through the clay. And so this is just um, uh, an example of a mindfulness and clay workshop that I do at the Garden Museum. And it's just a two hour workshop meeting folks for the first time. 10 folks will be invited and exploring breath and presence and clay and finding a way to interconnect and just moving in, in relationship with a mystery of that and just seeing what, uh, arises out of that process. And so here's just a glimpse of a sculpture from that process. And so as you can see, there's just the move, the fluidity and the movement there is extraordinary in terms of world that was captured. And uh, Cornelia Elbrecht shares that the jet, you know, every gesture in which we express ourselves contains the personal biographical and relational experience of our world. Like just even Shelley, as you were talking about that uh, youth experience in the yeah. body, I could see you kind of you know, noticing and, and echoing that in your own body and how the clay also holds that, mirrors that. And it's just such a beautiful material. And so the idea is how do we work, you know, from that, from the body, our breath to move mm -hmm. in. And so. And just know. to add, you know, having the um, great opportunity of being in the room with you and other participants for this particular 
um, workshop, um, it is actually working with clay for two hours and there's no talking. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and um, signing up with that knowledge that the goal isn't mm -hmm. to create a product. It really is about being with the process. And mm -hmm. it's um, such a powerful mm -hmm. uh, process to really just be provided with an art prompt and then really um, provide that response through art making, through the creation of the clay. And it's the folks that are coming too. They're like uh, folks who are interested in doing this work. They're, they're, it is such generative energy and the idea of reclaiming, knowing that mm -hmm. it's going to afterwards all the clay is then return back to bags. But there's such a generosity in that, knowing that the energy that they just put into the clay is going to then be passed and gifted on to somebody that they've never met. Mm -hmm. And it's just like that generosity is so present. And so, how could, and um, I'm always just. In I awe. think it's that invitation too, just about letting go. Yes. And, and, and meeting one another yes. in such an authentic way. And I guess there's that, that there's that authentic authenticity that happens with folks in relationship with the clay. And so then you hear them writing to clay and having, yeah. you know, dialogues with the clay. And here um, one artist shares, uh, I'm going to share her their quote first and another slide uh, because I think she speaks so eloquently to the experience of Kai. She shares hands once hiding my scars and stifling my voice now. A forest of hands supporting, holding, caring, cradling, reaching out, embracing my story. There's something about working with clay, the tactile experience using both hands. It's very primitive in a way for me. It access the more primitive parts of me the non-intellectual, emotional, childlike parts. I found myself angry or sad or both constantly while working with the Kai, finding a way to access those painful parts and working through them in a safe way was one of the most important resources mm -hmm. that I've ever found. And so that's extraordinary what she is sharing about her lived experience about how, you know, literally having her hands in the clay, she was able to befriend and attend and work with and meet all those different aspects of self in in relationship in movement and in terms so of it was really um at her own speed so that i think also speed, right. just as a way of providing such a safe vehicle to work with. that is such a beautiful beautiful point and it's and that again that sense of agency where the client is is leading mm -hmm. and and it, it makes me think of a client that let me know, all uh, right, because um, I uh, you know really excited about the sensory motor training and I'm thinking and one person was leading from a very, it seemed from my lens, a very young, young place. And I was concerned that to make sure she's got that compassionate, you know, adult self online while working with the clay. And I stepped in with a sense of eagerness around, you know, just wanted to check in with what was happening. And she let me know. Uh, you know, back off and and she but had, and, and she had it. She had that she had it, and it was a really important piece for her because it was like just to trust that she knew there was something that she was sensing into this experience that she just needed to explore, and that was so important for her mm -hmm. to let. That was a beautiful pivotal point for her and for me. You know, just in terms of noticing, yeah, I'm really caring for that dance mm -hmm. and deep attunement and um, so and clay is such a teacher yeah. and it's a, a teacher i guess in terms of that felt sense in our body right because touch you know it's immediate in terms of uh the exterior mm -hmm. sectors originating from the five senses and the interior sectors the internal felt sense of connective tissue viscera muscle bone become naturally stimulated and every movement of the hands provides instant feedback to the brain this beautiful relationship that go that just keeps a, a circuit going exactly um, so I guess that's really, really, I think we've really just spoken about this, but in, we're really talking about a bottom-up approach, you know, psychotherapy. And so we we'll just talk a little bit about that. And so, yeah. So with the, on or should um, I? Well, I guess it's, you know, bottom-up in terms of we're starting, you know, from that, uh, you know, trusting what needs to be expressed and move through breath and body into the clay and then dialoguing. You can journal with the clay in terms of what's arising to make sense of that and connection from the body to the brain and brain to body.
And so I, I just love this image because I think it does such a great job of really kind of bringing this home and um, helping remind us that trauma really is a physiological phenomenon rather than a psychological one. And here a skill for motion regulation, how just this idea about um, shaking things off in the movement, being, um, being able to allow us to reset. Oh. And so critical to for us as practitioners, you know, just um, noticing movements like tracking, like in sensory motor, we're often tracking movements, just being really mindful of how folks are, you know, in terms of their body, what they're expressing, like for example, with the clay. So for example, um, this artist had been continuing to do this repetitive moment uh, movement of just smoothing, like uh, you'll see, you know, those red um, uh, pieces like of fur. fur. Yes. And initially when she was just working with that movement, she was creating this dog that just kept collapsing. And um, what helped was that uh, inviting a sense of curiosity and exploring that uh, movement as opposed to being lost within that movement. And so I'm going to just, you know, just, just share uh what came, the sculpture that came from this. Did you have something? Yeah, I just, I think even just looking at it today, you know, sometimes uh, that's the beauty too right. about having uh, a live document to the work. Because even just now noticing the position of the head and how it's kind of lowered. And, and I think that that also speaks about um, sometimes with trauma, how uh, just with respect to, to um, shame. And how shame tends to um, invite us to keep our heads lower. And so moving uh, from this to... Okay, oh, so actually you want to read, read this. I do. And I really love that you just kind of slowed it down to really look at the gaze because you're reminding me this of the uh, pot that here that's here. And it's actually a heart-like vessel. Oh. And it's about inviting that compassionate presence, you know, to be with this process. So, oh my goodness. And of course, we're not, uh, in terms of doing psychoeducation, it's lived experience that's happening in the making. It's so profound. So she, there's two, um, two parts to this um, uh, statement. So you'll also see the second part in the next slide. I've practiced my silence like a nun wearing red, a habit emblazoned with shame, rigid and frozen, unreadable or reachable. I have stayed safe from being a target. Today I share my truth and take off the red habit, draw fresh breath while puffing out anger, self-loathing and disgust. Muscles quiver, tense and release as a mighty ripple arcs through me like electricity, causing my hair to fluff and stand, fan out, and I take a deep breath to speak the truth and take on the target means I have to be on my feet, ready for interaction. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, oh my goodness, what, you know, what has been transformed, moved through, integrated, you know, so processed, integrated. So I'm beautiful. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> extraordinary. This is from Janina Fisher. And, uh, so if you're wanting to explore more with respect to sensory motor practices, she's done extraordinary work with respect to shame. And so I think we can move on. Okay. Yes. And so just a little bit about metaphor, because again, you um, be able to see it actually in the uh, play pieces themselves, but just this idea of uh, invitations that, um, that are extended to the children and youth that I work with as a way of, of helping kind of mobilize um, really a narrative of one's experience. And um, so I would say that metaphor has also been, it is um, key in the work that mm. is done in the projects that, that I'm working with. What about sharing the, the project with Shiro's? That was so beautiful. Actually, I, I'm gonna share a different one, but oh, uh, yeah, because okay. <laughs> I was thinking about this I, and really been doing this now for uh, uh, 17 years. So there's been 17 different metaphors that have been used. And, and I was just thinking about one that came, came back and I think I was just really just reminded about the connection around universality. And so it was about working with the very first um, entry into group was inviting all the participants to create a turtle. And then there was, um, and the reason why it was a turtle was because turtles are actually found all over the world. And um, so it was really about um, also honoring how people, you know, just in terms of movement, can go at their own pace. And then so it was about 
um, again, just building on the metaphor of the strength of a turtle, um, using stories, even uh, bringing in the story of the uh, turtle and the hare. So sometimes, um, like it's slow and steady <laughs> is what wins the race. So it's just a, it's a it's an invitation that um, really can broaden. Um, and I think even going back earlier and talking about clay and, and working with the kiln, I think so often too, it's, it's about um, sometimes with, with um, participants imagining as if, you know, they're in hell and, and really kind of joining them there as, as a way of, of um, being alongside and um, coming out together. And I so, I so love how it was, it was also connected with, you know, Turtle Island, you know, in terms yes, of the land, right. you know, so gorgeous, right? That's just right. as, as a beautiful, you know, that how it embodied all aspects. It was just gorgeous. And so I think um, just, you know, just again, um, having this kind of DBT um, framework that's always kind of running through my head um, and how really the relationship between art therapy principles and, and DBT um, in many ways our uh, work in partnership. And I just would uh, bring notice to, uh, if you're interested in learning more or reading more, uh, um, it's a recommendation. Susan Clark has a great book that has um, a number of exercises mm -hmm. that, uh, depending on the skill that you want to support a, a client in, in building um, with respect to art. It's a, it's a book that, I've, I, that I um, have been going to. <laughs> It continues. Mm -hmm. So we move okay. back into mindfulness. Yes. So the mindfulness is also a key piece with respect to sensory motor practices. And just want to share that um, similarly with the adult group, we always um, begin groups with a mindfulness practice. And usually the mindfulness uh, um, practice is in alignment with whatever is kind of arising for the group. So I'll give you an example. But first of all, before um, sharing that example, just noticing the stack sculpture that so that it's actually um, a stack sculpture of all the mindfulness pieces over the 12 weeks of the group. And at the last, the last week, there are all these pieces are on fire and then they're returned back to water and dissolve in the group. And it's about uh, mm -hmm. what um, what they're taking away. Um, and then that clay gets uh, reclaimed and then passed on to the next group. I think it's actually coming to your group, the clay. Yes. That is exciting. <laughs> I didn't know that. Because <laughs> that was a new, mm -hmm. that was because uh, I've been dissolving, but myself, I, I don't uh, reclaimed it all just recently so it was and it was such a journey it was an awesome journey yeah. <laughs> so just wanted to give you some resources with respect to, this is an incredible book uh, sensory motor psychotherapy by um, Pat Ogden and Janina Fisher and so just wanted to give you some resources you know in terms of you know an ultimate source and also Janina Fisher has come out with a, also has a, a book around um, fragmented selves that I found oh, is oh. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful book. So I just wanted to, yeah. Oh no, it's just, yeah. <laughs> so just uh, excited. I guess I I'm just am, excited. I'm... Likewise, just excited to share because this is, this is such a sweet practice, you know, so just in terms of talking about what are those different mindfulness practices? So for the last day, um, you know, folks are coming into the group and they know it's their last day of sculpting. So it's important and they know that it's going to go into the kiln. So there's lots of fear about going into the kiln that things could um, explode. Their piece, somebody else's piece, could be a stranger's piece. And so it's like releasing into the unknown. How do they open to that experience? And so... So we invite um, doing a mindfulness practice about creating a kiln deity. And this is a practice that migrated from China. And it was about, um, so for example, and potters to this day will create little kiln deities to accompany their pieces when they're in the kiln. So also in another metaphor, a gorgeous metaphor about building a resource, right? And, you know, here's your ally mentor, you know, that can join walk, you yeah, <laughs> in the fire. <laughs> You know, so this is actually uh, uh, a kiln deity I found. It was quite inspirational. Yeah, so we'll just 
So this is a gorgeous. Maybe can we go back oh, to that slide just sure. before? Because I just I love this quote. Um, Sorry, it, and yeah, it was just with one of the artists, and just around that sense of that interconnectedness uh, with Clay. She shares, we have worked with clay, which is a mixture of water and earth. The flow and movement of water offer us lessons about change and malleability. Water allows us to shape the clay. The solidity and weight of earth offer stability and groundedness. Earth holds the clay into a form. Clay is both movement and stillness, strength and flexibility. Wow. And that's, so again, from the words of the participants, the lived experience, how much you know, the knowledge just rests in, you know, the truth rests when we can, yeah, get, get underneath, you know, whatever those habits are and, you know, our true self, you know, merges with the clay. I think there's this um, beautiful oh, yes. um, piece that uh, to be shared with you just around vulnerability and um, the essence of one of oneself and in, in the many parts to make that go in um, and acknowledging oneself. And uh, there's a, uh, I just want to share something from Janina Fisher, you know, that might give a bit of really uh, sweet context. I'm just going to read this piece from her, a quote, uh, which is in your next slide. And she shares it, helping clients learn to become curious and interested in their symptoms and able to identify the voices that speak through the reactions can change the relationship to themselves and to the past from one of shame and dread to one of compassion. So for example, you know, the person with the, you know, in terms of the dog, you know, that, that motion, as soon as that invitation from curio about curiosity, it just was a different stance. And here, knowing that each part is charged with the mission to survive, each in its own way helps clients to see how they survived was more crucial than how they were victimized. Understanding how each part participates in survival increases the sense of we together and challenges the sense of being abandoned and alone. And Judy Rebick uh, just came out with a book called Heroes in My Head about her own story and with respect to, you know, different parts. And so, and here's a beautiful teaching piece around holding the different parts with us. So I guess that's something that they could read on their own, right? Yeah. Um, absolutely. But I, I also just wanted to um, acknowledge that it wasn't just these, you know, these incredible, gorgeous nests that have been built, but it's also the twine that um, also is um, really wrapped around them as well that I thought was quite poetic. Yes, and uh, and the wisdom and what she shares, you know, so malleable is the plastic brain that as many compartments can be created as needed to sustain the abuse. It's just extraordinary. Um, so maybe moving into um, hope and resilience. Oh, yes, yes. So with respect to hope and resilience, uh, this is from a group out of the fire, our journey from survivors to thrivers. And they, in this, their collective statement, they share ever so slowly within us, a, a tree of life takes root, rising out of the wildfire destruction of abuse, like the hues of a butterfly, the richness of our creativity is emerging. And this is this piece, uh, another one just extraordinary and talking about you know that relate you know that compassionate presence you know when we can be present for those different parts those different aspects of self and to move and be with so um another incredible teacher this artist with your piece here the outer tree is dead yet a seedling survives i live with wounds on my outer shell deep painful mm -hmm. scarring marks made over time yet inside me is a child that is a seed of hope. This child sparks an, a, a light of new growth, cradled and nurtured by the hands that were once full of despair. So just in terms of, she's teaching us also about what's helpful in terms of developing that mindfulness connection with you know, our experience.
And just as another teacher uh, reminds us too about resilience and what has actually been um, supports in terms of healing. And so uh, in terms of this artist statement, um, uh, she writes that here, the bad is the disease, the disease that took over me, that made me scared at night, who abused me every time. The line is courage. It has the courage to fight the disease, to overcome from the hurt, to rise from the occasion, to stand tall and strong. The tree represents peace. It's the tree of life. The tree represents me, strong and courageous. And then there is me listening to my music, reading a book, free from the disease, just me peaceful and free, peaceful with my tree of life. So and so I think just having that opportunity mm. to, again, um, really kind of document um, mm. what it is that has been helpful in the, in the mm. healing process at the same time, um, not being able to really meet what that trauma was as a way of taming it. Mm. So I guess it's thinking that if you can name it, you can tame it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's that befriending, that gorgeous, uh, you know, uh, relationship with the client, like, constantly get to reset you know mm -hmm. in terms of every time you're coming back to your sculpture and you get to meet it again and meet yourself in a different way and how do you open to that and it's, like, it's such a gorgeous relationship yeah that actually makes me think too because sometimes um something will look as if it's going to be one way and that's the beauty of working with the clay too as well um in terms of taking care of it from week to week there could be some um some transitions that occur Right. And it's just that the aliveness of the, that connection is so potent. And this piece was, um, okay, the, this artist was still experiencing intimate partner violence when um, the show was going on and, and was really, really struggling to leave. And so you'll see the sculpture to the left uh, she actually had two signs to take the roof off of both of these sculptures. And what happened was that on the, and so for example, you see um, a figure looking up to uh, a taller figure and reaching out this taller figure, which was a mentor for her with respect to her Baha'i faith. And, um, and that was her hope was to move into the, this new home and a sense of safety and, uh, and um, on the opening night she actually had an opera singer sing the song that uh, from her Baha'i faith that this mentor would sing to her to help her make this transition mm -hmm. yes and so this is her statement now I have hope for the future I no longer believe I'm fundamentally flawed I no longer believe I deserve to be abused I now believe I deserve happiness equality and respect and after this exhibit, a little while after, it, wasn't, it was pretty soon after, that she was able to then leave. And so how important it is to take this work into community and how we need all of us you know, to create social change. And so with that, we've, um, we're coming towards a close, but we have uh, two more slides that we'd like to share. And um, so this is... Um, um, tiles that were created um, as a way of really ensuring that the the work continues and um, and lives on. And so, with the groups that the children and adolescents uh, participate in, there's always a sh um, there's the individual sculptures that get created as well as uh, contribution to a shared sculpture that remains behind. Mm -hmm. And so it's this pay it forward practice. Mm -hmm. And so it really is about, you know, going back to this idea about agents of change, so that every participant in a group knows that they too are having um, an influence, um, messages of support mm -hmm. um, that are left behind for anybody else, the next that are walking through the door that um, who've, who will have experienced an awesome form of interpersonal violence. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful practice. Mm -hmm. And so um, as we come to an end, we really wanted to share this quote from the book, Turn This World Inside Out. So what would it look like to belong in the world as our whole selves? What kind of culture, knowledge and community structures would we be able to create if we could nurture one another without our armor on? If we could draw out and develop the gifts in one another 
if we could care for one another in concrete, meaningful ways and could protect one another from systemic harms and forms of structural violence, even as we're struggling to dismantle them? What do we already have waiting within us that can guide us in that direction? And so with that, we are going to put it back to you in terms of um, any questions that, um, or comments perhaps you'd like um, to share. While we're waiting for questions, uh, I, I did forget to mention at the very beginning, um, you'll notice that in your PDFs, um, if they are not, um, what's not included is uh, photographs of the artwork and I think that um, we both have just have a, um, a belief that in terms of, of although the artwork was um, provided for the purpose of education and training um, I think that there's still this idea of, of um, wanting to be mindful and kind of um, have a, a sense of protection of where 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 they're going. Yeah, this is that folks always know exactly what the contacts are, you know, so it's just that when it goes online, that's a whole other journey. <laughs> this too is a new journey for us as we are <laughs> working with this webinar and waiting for waiting for questions. Just thank you for the gift of joining us and we're just excited in terms of the unknown ripple effects. <laughs> but yeah, folks can always connect with us though, if they wish. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Pearl's making us feel anything's possible. <laughs> oh, there's a question. No questions today. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm glad he, that somebody was sharing it. There's lots of reply. Also, I guess just to, as a reminder too, in your, P, uh, in your PDFs, there's lots of resources oh, yes. and references that we've included. So that mm -hmm. might be another um, avenue to explore mm -hmm. if, if, if your curiosity has been piqued. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, miigwech. <laughs> Say miigwech. Oh. We really are a very welcoming <laughs> group. I wonder how we all can get together to work with some clay, though. <laughs> Big social action, like on a large scale. Okay, that's, I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> So we've just been informed that um, there's that opportunity. If you don't um, have any questions in this moment, uh, feel free to email Pearl and uh, she'll connect with, mm -hmm. Susan, um, with the both of us. So thank you all. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Sergio. Sergio. Yes. yes, thank you, Sergio. Have a great day, everybody.